So I will hide down. down here. So the only thing we need to save in the map on the will be this. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, sorry for the Okay. Is that too dark? Yeah. Two? Okay. Cool. All right. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Cool. Well, sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm Shelby. I'm a PhD student in the Curriculum for Environment Ecology. Um, and today I'm really excited to host our um, Charles E. Jenner Memorial Lectureship. Um, it's Dr. James Emmett Duffy. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, Dr. Jenner was a professor in zoology here at UNC and was actually a marine um, ecologist who studied marine invertebrates. And so a lot of what we know about the North Carolina marine invertebrates are due to him. And um, funny enough, I just found out a little bit ago that uh, he was actually on Emmett's committee when Emmett was a PhD student here at UNC. Um, and he also apparently said that one of, he was dancing as he left a PhD defense and it was actually Emmett and he said it was the best defense he had ever been to. Um, I never heard that one. <laughs> I heard that. Yeah. And he also, um, for those who don't know, he was really big in marine invertebrates, like I said, and he has some amphipods named after him. So Gamerous generi, and that's really great because Emmett has done a lot of his work in his career on marine amphipods. So, so many connections here. Um, to go on to Emmett Duffy, I had the opportunity to work with Emmett before I came here at UNC and worked for him for two years. And so I'm really honored that he was able to come for a talk. Um, he started his career at Spring Hill College and got a bachelor's of science in biology. He then went to the University of Maine at Orno to get his master's and then came here um, to UNC and got his PhD in marine sciences under the advisorship of Mark, oh yeah, Mark Hay. I don't know why I stopped. Um, and then he went on and was a per he did a bunch of postdocs and was a professor at the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. Um, and now is the director of the Tenenbaum Marine Observatory Network at the Smithsonian. Um, but with that, uh, Emmett can take it away. Thanks, Shelby. Thanks for that story, Chris. Uh, Never heard that one. I remember hearing it anyway. So it's it's great to be here, uh, to be back here, and uh, seeing some of my various. Uh, I'm not going to say old friends. I'll just say friends that that I've known from previous times, as well as as well as Shelby. Um, so I would like to talk today um, about uh, an aspect of of the changing Earth system. So we all know that 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 uh, the world is changing uh, all around us, and, and I'd like to focus on one. Uh, one particular aspect of that, which is how changing biodiversity uh, influences how ecosystems function, what they do in terms of pro, uh, producing biomass, uh, stability of uh, oxygen and carbon storage and so on. And I'm just gonna go ahead and start with my punchline, uh, which is that biodiversity is as important as climate to the functioning of ecosystems. It's a pretty generic statement. Um, I can understand that you might be skeptical about that. Uh, so I'm hoping that I can convince you over the course of the next half an hour or so uh, that, that that's true. So um, to do so, I think uh, it, it's helpful to, to sort of zoom out to the Earth system perspective uh, and ask, you know, what, what is it that drives global patterns of productivity, for example? And um, part of the answer to that, press to minimize image. What does that mean? Um, nothing's happening. Pull the uh, leftmost USB stick, the rightmost USB stick out and pop back in. Sorry, pull the, the pull the black one out. Yeah. Okay. Pop back in. Put it back in. <laughs> Is this a test? <laughs> um, okay. Now let's try that. No. Nah. Hmm. What about if I just do this? No? No. Oh. Ah, maybe it will work now. No. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Right. So what, um, what drives productivity? Well, um, obviously, at some fundamental level, uh, the physics of the Earth system drives global patterns of productivity. 
the shape of the continents, the rotation of the Earth, how that influences the, the uh, patterns of water and airflow that distribute moisture and heat around the Earth. That's sort of the template. And in fact, one of the triumphs of oceanography, and, and for that matter, uh, ecology over the last several decades, has been developing these high uh, resolution pictures of both the vegetation and understanding of these physical processes that allow us to, to predict um, where we have high productivity and low productivity, or at least biomass. But what about, what about the, other, the other direction? How does biology uh, influence the, uh, the Earth system and, and patterns of productivity? So um, this is a figure from the IPCC's report in 2007. Um, and, you know, from an Earth system perspective, we typically think uh, of biology, uh, in this case, it's not a black box, it's a little white box, um, but it's small and it's kind of all in, in this one place. Um, I don't mean to, to, to caricature this. This is, of course, a simplified diagram. It's, you know, over 10 years old now. Um, but, but this is uh, the way, at least historically, biology has, has often been treated in, in these kinds of uh, models. Now, obviously, we know um, that, th that that thin blue film or thin green film uh, that, that we're accustomed to thinking of biology or the biosphere in is, is actually more than that. And it has ac actually consists of a spectacularly rich, uh, you know, array of, of species that are doing different things. And so uh, the, the question, you know, one question that arises is um, what would happen um, if this were the same biomass, but it was um, a film, a, a soup of green phytoplankton or a film of algae growing on the rocks. So we know that that system would work differently. Um, but, the, but the question um, coming back to biodiversity, very broadly speaking, is what, what is the role of, of variety per se? That is the, the numbers of species uh, in a system. How do, how do we get at that? Well, up until not terribly recently, at least by my time frame, and I'm older than most of you, uh, we, science couldn't actually provide an answer to that. Um, and this became a very acute question as a result of understanding that um, species are being lost and some say that we're in, coming into the sixth mass extinction and so on. So the, there, there are obviously many reasons to be concerned about losing species, but one sort of utilitarian one is what effect does that have? So Paul Ehrlich famously uh, made the analogy um, between an ecosystem and a, an airplane uh, with species being the rivets or the parts of the airplane and that you can pull rivets out of a plane and for a while nothing much happens, but at some point you get to the stage where the machine falls apart and it crashes and it's no good. So the, the analogy is that was that in ecosystems, there are, you know, you can start to lose species that go extinct, depending on who they are, you might not have much, uh, much effect on, on the things that we care about. But at some point, that's going to tip the system into uh, a new um, uh, and different situation. So does that actually happen? Uh, in the real world. Um, well, we can get some insights into this uh, from the natural history of, of the organisms uh, that we look at. So the, if you look, for example, at the plants growing in a prairie, um, you can see that they have very different um, structures and, and morphologies that are related to resource capture. Some of them are high up, relatively speaking, uh, in the air to capture sunlight uh, above the other ones. Some of them put their roots way down deep into the, to the water table, others capture it from um, near the surface. So the, the hypothesis has been that by having species with many different characteristics, you, the, a diverse community is able to capture more of the uh, resources and therefore produce more biomass. It's very much uh, like what um, uh, one would think of for an economy. That is that um, as you, where you have more businesses or, or actors, um, th there are a couple of different mechanisms how that can increase productivity. One is that it selects for the, for the actors that do the best job, uh, that are the most productive. The other is that different species may interact with one another to, uh, to increase productivity um, using one another's waste streams, for example, as we see in some mutualisms. So that's, that's kind of the theory. How do we know uh, whether that's happening? Well, um, 20 years or so ago, um, this, this question sort of caught fire in academic ecology. And um, we saw the beginning of a series of experiments that said, let's go out in the field uh, and test 
this question of what difference it makes to have multiple species. So this is the Cedar Creek uh, long-term ecological uh, site in Minnesota, Charles's uh, uh, old, old stomping grounds, uh, I believe. And um, this, this is where some of the, the really uh, um, seminal work by Tillman's group was done. And the general approach was you plant these different plots. You can see, let's see, I have a little thingy in here, right? So you can see these different plots. Some of them have a single species, some have three, some have 12, some have 32. And the, the approach was to plot those with the same number of seeds in all of them, but different numbers of species, let them grow, harvest it all at the end, and ask what's the community biomass. So here are the results of, of some of these uh, experiments, uh, again, from, from Cedar Creek. So we're looking at the number of species number planted on the x-axis uh, and the, the total bio, let's, let's just look at the top one here, the total biomass at the end of the, of the experiment. You can see a couple of things. One is that in general, the total productivity or biomass accumulation increases with the number of species. The other one is that it increases through time. So in other words, the first time that the experiment was, was done, you saw, you know, a, a, a increase from say two to six species or so and not much after that. But through time, that um, diversity effect got larger and we can come back to why that might be uh, a little bit later. So it now turns out that hundreds of experiments have been done like this and I think we can say that the jury is in, um, that this is a general pattern. Um, there are some differences between, for example, uh, experiments with plants and experiments with herbivores, but in general, what we do see is a positive relationship between species number and, and community biomass and, then, and, and, a, and a sort of a decelerating uh, asymptotic uh, curve. So again, this, this comes back to the rivet hypothesis that at the highest diversity, when you take species out, things don't change much, but as you take more species out, it starts to plummet. Right. So um, the question is, does it actually matter in nature? So there are various reasons to expect that, that the situation might be different in the real world. So here's what we can say that we see in experiments. There's a, a pretty general positive relationship. And there's a couple of different possibilities. You know, one is that because the real world is much more complex than these simple experiments, because you have a lot of other things going on that we know influences productivity, climate and nutrients and so on, maybe that swamps everything out and there actually is no effective species riches. You, there's also an argument to be made in the opposite direction. That is that you might expect diversity effects to actually be greater in the real world because you have many more species. You've had more time for these plots to, to grow up and for species to develop um, the, the kinds of interactions and mutualisms with one another that could increase productivity and so on. We don't know. So the obvious, uh, way to go about this is to actually go out in the real world and ask what you see. But it's not as straightforward as it might seem um, because there's lots going on out in nature and it's kind of hard to disentangle those in non-experimental uh, data. Um, but um, we are now accumulating enough data sets that measure diversity and other drivers in community biomass that it's possible to start doing this using sophisticated uh, quantitative uh, analyses. And to my mind, the, the, the gold standard for this and what really got me excited about it initially was this paper by uh, Paquette and Messier for Canadian forests, where they had this incredible data set um, with over 12,000 trees that are taken through, that, that are measured you know, repeatedly through time, not just the total biomass, but the actual increment in growth by uh, the, the, the circumference. Anyway, so they use path analysis to look at how various aspects of climate, temperature, moisture, and so on, and environment, mostly soil characteristics, influenced the total community productivity uh, with also looking at species richness and functional diversity. There's a lot of arrows and numbers in there that it's not terribly important to see. Um, what I'll just tell you is, you, you know, obviously climate has an effect on productivity. We know that, and that is shown here. Um, but we also find that part of that effect comes through uh, diversity components and that there is actually a significant um, effect of both of, of species and functional diversity on the productivity of these forests. So that was kind of interesting. Um, it's not an isolated 
case, I'll just show one aquatic example here that used a sort of similar approach. And this is from uh, the EPA collates data from over 1,100 lakes around the country where there are data on water quality, phytoplankton, uh, biomass, and, and taxon richness. And um, basically, uh, Zimmerman and Cardinelli did this analysis and found that algal richness, th these are the, the partial uh, or standardized coefficients of here, that algal richness was about as important as nitrogen across these lakes in predicting uh, phytoplankton uh, biomass, and actually more important than phosphorus. Who knew? Uh, I, I was quite surprised by these. And so this stimulated us to go out and look at you know, how much data are available for doing this kind of thing and what can we find out from it. So uh, Brad Cardinelli and Casey Godwin and, Godwin and I um, did a literature search on this, looking for studies that had field observations as opposed to you know, mesocosm experiments, measured community biomass diversity and environmental drivers. We found about 67 studies <clears throat> some of which had multiple estimates taken from over 600,000 locations, which means field plots, um, basically. And we asked a couple of well, three questions. Um, first of all, do we just do we see evidence from the field observational data that diversity affects uh, biomass production as we saw in experiments? And secondly, um, th th this is related to some of the criticisms that have been made of the the um, of the uh, of, of previous field correlations between diversity and biomass. Are those effects confounded by because diversity and biomass are both controlled by some third environmental variable? And then finally, how important are they relative to everything else that we know is uh, influencing uh, biomass in the field? So uh, I'll just show a couple of results from this. Um, the first thing we found is that is that yes, we do see um, average positive effects of diversity on community biomass across a wide range of different aquatic terrestrial systems and organisms. Um, and I, I should say all of these used um, statistical techniques that allow you to parse out the effects of uh, and, and get the partial effects of each of these potential drivers, temperature, nutrients, soil moisture, diversity, and so on. So what, what, what's being, what I'm, you're seeing here is these are just the proportion of the total estimates or studies that we looked at that showed a significant effect of diversity, uh, more did than did not. The before and after is, is looking at the correlations of diversity and community biomass um, before and after other um, environmental drivers were statistically corrected for, okay? And again, this gets to the, 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 the suggestion that the reason that you see these relationships is because they're, they're due to some other confounding factor. We find that in fact, that that's, that's not, that does not appear to be the case. In other words, when you correct for, this is the gray after bars, when you take out the, parse out the effects of the other environmental factors, the diversity effect is actually stronger than it was before. So biodiversity appears to be more, not less important after controlling uh, for the covariance. And they're mostly positive. So the, the the other thing that, that um, came out of this that, that really surprised us um, and that I think really is the most important result is that biodiversity, uh, according to, to these um, studies, appears to be roughly as important as climate and nutrients in, in um, driving or in uh, explaining community biomass, again, across a variety of, of kinds of systems. So what, what I'm showing here is, it, so for each of these studies, we ranked, and I should say these are based on the analyses done by the, the authors of the paper. So we did not have access to the raw data. Um, but we looked at the analyses they ran and found that, um, and, and what the estimates here are, are the partial regression coefficients or some, something similar to that. So we find that actually in, in these studies, about half of them um, found that climate was the most important driver of community biomass. And roughly the other half found that biodiversity was actually as the, the, the first rank or the, or the most important um, driver. When we compared biodiversity versus nutrients, we found that biodiversity was ranked first in actually more of the cases than nutrients were ranked first. 
So biodiversity appears to be uh, as important uh, as climate and nutrient supply, according to these studies. I know what you're saying, um, and you're right. I mean, correlation is not causation. Um, so how does one deal with this kind of situation? Um, these are, generally speaking, complex field systems where um, comparisons have been made across a bunch of plots. Um, it's not, I, I won't say it's not possible, but it's very challenging to try and do this experimentally. But at some point, to my mind, one has to appeal to parsimony. So theory suggests <clears throat> that having a more diverse community will be more productive. The experiments on balance suggest that. And we're seeing patterns in uh, the observational data <clears throat> that look very similar to what we see in experiments in theory. So at some point, one has to ask, what is the least convoluted chain of reasoning that brings you to this? And I think you probably know what I think. Um, I'm beginning to think, after studying this for 20 years, that it's actually true. Uh, um, I'd be happy to talk about whether you believe that. So, so, so then the, the, the question, of course, becomes, well, what is the mechanism? What, what could be driving these kinds of patterns and explaining them? And for that, I'd like to return to um, coral reefs and, and other rock, hard, hard bottom marine systems because I know them better than some of the others and because there's a fair amount known about the natural history of these systems that can help us uh, understand that. And to begin with, I want to start with um, what I consider to be probably the best marine biodiversity database out there, which is the result of the, uh, <clears throat> the Reef Life Survey Program. This is a, uh, a program that was dreamed up by uh, Graham Edgar at the University of Tasmania, who I consider actually a visionary uh, for this. Basically, he reckoned that it was really not going to be possible to, to, to get good data on the state of the world's um, reefs uh, if j just by relying on scientists to go out and collect the data. There, there just aren't enough marine biologists in the world. So what he decided to do was to en enlist sport divers and train them how to do this. So it's a citizen science project in, in a sense, but what I think is unique about it is they carefully vet individual divers and train them very intensively by taking them out on a fabulous dive vacation for a week but also making them work hard and, te and, and you know, training them to do this and, and, until they've passed the, the test and then turning them loose. So there are now over 4,000 fish surveys uh, as well as benthic community composition at over 1,800 sites from Svalbard to Patagonia. Um, most of them are in Australia because that's where Graham is um, and a lot of it in the tropics, but a, a really amazing data set. So a couple of years ago, we decided to ask the question with this data set of do you see uh, effects of, uh, do you see a, a role of, for biodiversity in productivity of fish communities? And I, okay, I should strictly speaking say, standing biomass at the community level of the fishes. Um, and the answer uh, is yes. This is one of the studies that went into the, the meta-analysis that I just mentioned. So if you look at this in a simple binary way, looking at the log of, of fish richness um, versus total fish community biomass, you see um, a lot of scatter, of course, because this is worldwide, but you also see a positive relationship. That's for individual sites. If you then restrict this to say, let's look at the mean for each of the eco-regions in which this has been done, which is these different uh, colored things or eco-regions. Um, there are, I can't remember how many eco-regions uh, in this, maybe 70. And you, you, you see a similar um, pattern of, of a positive pattern. Now, you also begin to see that asymptotic pattern that in the tropics, which are the blue uh, symbols, um, they're highly diverse, there's not much difference. But then as not much uh, influence of richness, but as richness starts to decline through these temperate systems, you get lower fish biomass. Now, obviously there are differences between temperate and tropical uh, environments in many ways. So what we then did was to take a bunch of data from the World Ocean Database and so on, and, and do a, uh, um, a, multi, a, a, you know, a, a, hier a hierarchical uh, linear model to try and estimate and parse out what the, the partial effects of each of those things were. And that's what we're showing here. These are the effect sizes. So um, the blue ones up here are species richness and functional diversity. This is human population density in the vicinity of the reef. 
And then these are a bunch of environmental characteristics. So the first thing you see is that the, the biggest number here is temperature. That's to be expected. We know that the temperature has a major effect on diversity, on, on metabolism, on, on uh, uh, community biomass. But, and, and we also see that there is a fairly strong negative effect of human presence, which we also know. Um, humans like to eat fish uh, and they eat a lot of them. Um, but, but what was really interesting about this, to my mind, is that after we've controlled for all of those things in the model, the remaining effects of richness, of diversity, are you know, comparable to human presence and, and larger than most of the other environmental characteristics other than, than temperature. So um, the, this is just to show that for reefs, we get the same kind of result that we saw earlier for the larger data set. So what I want to do now is think of it, is talk about how why that might be. Again, what's the mechanism? So there, we uh, I have a couple of um, pieces of of, uh, of evidence to, to show uh, in response to this. So most of them are not my my own work or, or our work, but one of them comes from uh, the work by McMahon et al. Simon Thorold and colleagues on on the support of fish biomass uh, on reefs, and this is work done in the Red Sea where basically they use stable isotopes of carbon or compound specific stable isotopes of carbon to trace where the food for these several different fish groups was coming from. And what's, what's shown here, the different colors um, within the, 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 each of these I believe is an individual fish, the different columns. Um, and these are uh, the different blocks here for different species of fish. And the, the different colors are different um, ultimate food sources, bases of the food web. So green is benthic algae growing on the rocks. Uh, pink is coral, the zooxanthellae in the coral, the, the symbiotic algal cells. Um, blue is plankton, planktonic production. And then the, the brown is, is sort of reworked detritus that, that, that's microbial uh, carbon. And basically what you see here is that there's a lot of variation among these fish, which I would say sort of different fish functional groups in where, where their carbon is coming from. So some of them are getting it from the plankton washing in off the reef, some are eating the algae on the rocks and so on. So that suggests that um, a, a diverse group of fish um, is going to capture more of the um, production that is available in the general reef environment. So let's go down within habitats uh, and, and, and look uh, a little bit closer. So one of the things that, that we were interested in doing um, in the Marine Geo program that, that uh, Shelby mentioned is, is to begin to get some standardized estimates of fish feeding uh, in the field. And to do that, we, we developed this uh, high-tech method uh, called the squid pop, which is basically um, a tomato steak with a little piece of, of uh, dried squid on the end of it. So it's essentially fishing. Um, you put the thing out, you check it after an hour, see if it's zero or one, it's gone or it's still there, and the same thing after 24 hours. On reefs, they're virtually all gone within an hour. Um, sometimes we video them so you can see who, eat them, who ate them. There's a, see this snapper is gonna come up and take it in a second here. Um, we, I, I don't have a, a picture of it, but we've also done uh, a similar kind of assay with algae to look at herbivory, which of course is a very important process uh, on on coral reefs, which John Bruno will ask me a question about uh, at the end. Um, so <laughs> it's important to know what, what the intensity of, of, of herbivory is. So what I'm showing here are, um, are uh, the results of the use of these squid pops and the weed pops, uh, which have the algae on them, not to be confused with what you can get in, in Colorado uh, <laughs> when, you're, when you're there. Um, so, so these are for uh, five different uh, habitats in Belize near our station, where we measured fish abundance and diversity using visual surveys, uh, and then also predation on squid pops and feeding on, on the weed pops. And this one is a bit more complicated because the weed pop is a, uh, basically a, a nylon rope that has five different kinds of algae on it. So we can look at the total grazing on all the algae and also the specificity. So the major thing here without going into a lot of the details is that uh, fish are more abundant and more diverse on reefs than they are over sand. We kind of knew that already. Uh, so, it, and as well as in seagrass. So uh, the reefs are the, the orange and, and purple ones, high fish richness, high fish abundance. We also got much higher predation uh, on the patch reefs and four reefs than we did in these other 
uh, habitats, and also higher herbivory on those. So you can see uh, in this case that the intensity of predation and herbivory um, are correlated with fish richness, but they're also correlated with habitat. So it's a little bit difficult to tease those apart, and I'm actually not going to try to do so. Um, but what I will do is, is show a, a little bit of data suggesting that part of the reason why this may be is that the more diverse fish communities in these places are actually eating more of the available food as we saw for the, um, for the carbon isotope data as well. So these are data from uh, Fiji by Doug Rasher and colleagues um, who basically set out something like our weed pops with, with different kinds of algae on them and then watched who ate them. Um, with, with, uh, with GoPro cameras. And basically, um, I, I know you can't read any of this stuff. It's actually not important. The main thing I wanna show is that these, this guy right here eats these algae uh, over on this side. This one eats about the same. This one eats the algae over here. And these guys just eat that one. Pretty interesting. And then there's a whole other group of species. I haven't shown you their picture. Which pictures which are feeding on the substrate, on the turfy algae that are on the rocks. So, so the point here is that um, different fish are eating different kinds of algae. So there's at least some reason to expect that, um, or I should say, th this is kind of um, natural history feeding data that would support the idea that diverse fish communities are taking more of the resources that are out there. And I'll just uh, support that with, with one additional um, piece of uh, information. This is from uh, Simon, Simon Brandel, um, who did this work in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef, and basically looked at where a fish were feeding. Um, so all of these guys are primarily uh, feeding on the turfy uh, filamentous algae that are growing on the surfaces of rocks, but they're often feeding in different places. So the, the major sort of herbivorous groups um, in, in, the, in the tropical Pacific are the surgeon fishes, the, the parrot fishes, and the, and the rabbit fishes. And what you can see is that what, what these um, bars show is the, the proportion of the grazing that's done by, by each of these three species. So up here on these flat horizontal surfaces, it's mostly these guys, the surgeon fish, the gray, the gray bars, but also a lot of the air fish. When you go onto these vertical surfaces, the surgeon fish are gone completely. So, so these guys are better able to use that resource and presumably turn it into their own biomass. And then finally, in these sort of cryptic areas inside the reef down here, it's only the rabbit fish, essentially, that are feeding. So um, both the combination of fish eating different things and eating in different places may be what is explaining uh, the, the results that, that we found. Okay, that's, that's my story for reefs. Um, what, what I would like to do now is, is return back to the Earth, Earth system kind of scale and perspective, and the question of how biology might drive some of these very large scale patterns of, uh, of, of productivity and other ecosystem processes. So who knows what these are? Stromatolites. Okay, several people said it once. Um, yeah, so this is, this is, you know, an artist's conception of the ocean, you know, three and a half billion years ago, give or take. And uh, there were still lots of volcanoes going on. The atmosphere was very different than, than it is today. And in fact, what, what we now know from various kinds of geochemical evidence and so on is that bacteria made the, uh, the, the atmosphere. So for example, this is a recent review on the rise of oxygen in Earth's early ocean and atmosphere, which um, appears to have been uh, oxygenated primarily by cyanobacteria growing um, in, in these uh, early, early uh, in the shallow oceans there uh, and creating oxygen, the beginning of photo photosynthesis. And it's not just the oxygenated atmosphere. Um, it's now believed that the flourishing or the, 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 the uh, um, yeah, the flourishing of eukaryotic algae sometime later, another billion years down the road, um, was likely responsible for a major cooling event in Earth history, the so-called snowball Earth. And the reason is that um, these algae uh, release uh, dimethyl sulfoxide, I believe, which is, nucleates clouds. And so the hypothesis is this created 
a, a big cloud cover that cooled things down. Okay, that was a few billion years ago, admittedly. Um, what about today? Is, is, this, is something like this still happening? And, you know, the, the probably not on that scale. But um, there are some really interesting, uh, there's some really interesting evidence that biology today is also having major effects on um, climate and environment. So for example, um, you've perhaps heard that the Amazon makes its, the Amazon rainforest makes its own climate. So it's believed now that the, the uh, retention of water by these trees, by the trans evapotranspiration and cycling between the tree biomass and the soil, keeps that water over the Amazon, uh, over this, this general region of the rainforest. And there is a lot of concern that by chopping all that away for uh, McDonald's uh, hamburgers on the hoof, that um, you, you actually break that cycle and that you can't get it back. So I, I'm paraphrasing, I'm a marine biologist, and I, I don't know the details of this, but other people do. And, and just one other example here is a similar kind of situation on a smaller scale are these cloud forests in Oman. So you may know that Oman is in a pretty arid region of the world. And yet, um, I didn't put a picture up here, but there are uh, certain areas in mountaintops that have these kind of moist forests. Um, and this, the situation is thought to be similar, that they are retaining water, um, probably uh, as relics from, from Pleistocene forests that were once over a much larger area and keeping that. And if they get completely eaten by camels, which is starting to happen, um, they, th that, that's lost. And so I, I bring these up as admittedly kind of speculative um, points, but just, just, to, just to make the point that the arrows can go in the opposite direction as well from organisms. I, I say biodiversity very broadly. Uh, here we're talking basically about vegetation. But in other words, for the kinds of organisms that are present on a site, whether they are arid land grasses or these trees can have a big effect on, on the local uh, environment. Thanks, happy to answer questions. Community assembly over time. Um, so, uh, going back to the Cedar Creek data, um, you know what? I'm not sure if this is going to answer the question, but what what I what what seems to come out from what I've seen in these experiments is that um, for communities that are assembled over very short time frames. Um, you, you tend to get this, the flush of the, the sort of R selected, if I might use that, the, the weedy species that grow up. And, um, and, and that sort of dominates the processes. But, but over time, um, as, as other species come in that take more time to compete or to use the resources or, or so on, that that may be one reason that, that is explaining uh, that change over time and, um, in, the, uh, in the Cedar Creek data. But you would know better than me, so I just. No, not necessarily. Does that answer? Is that what you're? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so some species take a long time to get established. Um, you know, they they can't live in disturbed soil, which all of these things are starting under disturbed conditions, and so it takes time. And I think I think I suspect that that's that's a major pattern in in why you see um, strong relationships that that appear to be even stronger than experimental. Um, you present a pretty convincing case that losing biodiversity kind of going to increase productivity. Have you seen any studies where people are trying to restore biodiversity mm -hmm. and thereby restore productivity? Mm -hmm. How successful are those mm -hmm. attempts? Is there a tipping point in the opposite direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So um, let me preface this by saying the reason that, that, that we looked at um, species richness as kind of our x-axis variable is because lots of people measure that. Um, you know, 
it's important to keep in mind, and I, this is what I was trying to get at with the fish in, in, in the, the latter part, is that individual species are doing things. You know, the, the, the number of species in a system is, is in some ways a, just a very crude proxy for kind of the interactions among species of particular kinds of species doing particular things. So I bring that up because in restoration contexts, oftentimes, um, well, in a particular context on the, on the ground, so to speak, the most important thing to know is what species do what you want them to do in that area, right? And so most restoration um, is, is, is focused on particular species. On the other hand, um, it, it, I, I think it's um, becoming appreciated that in some contexts, it's important to have multiple species that can interact with one another or that can provide some insurance when environmental conditions change. Uh, I'm not sure if I can answer the question in, in terms of knowing what, what people are doing in restoration ecology. I, I'd be very interested if, if others can answer that because I'd love to know actually. Um, the scale at which a lot of conservation activities might happen through either regional, um, and the scale at which most of the CES things are being done, mm -hmm. the scale at which you can measure what activities. So, how, how, how would you suggest to sort of do that? <laughs> um. Well, actually, I'm not sure that there is a, a big difference be, because certainly there is with the experiments. I mean, the experiments are small plots. Cedar Creek are among the largest that have been done in terms of both the plot size and the number of species in them. And those are, I don't know, several meters on a, on a side. Um, on the other hand, the, the observational data that I showed, um, probably could go back to the map, but at any rate, um, are over much larger scales. I mean, the, the, the reef life fish data is literally global in extent. Now, that's the extent of the comparisons, but that kind of raises another issue about, you know, what does it mean to compare something, you know, in, in Patagonia with, with something in the Caribbean, right? And, and I think that <clears throat> we did do this within ecoregions as well, which, which controls to some degree for the species pool that's in there. And, and you, get, you, get, you continue to get strong relationships in some places, um, less so in the tropics where you, you have very high uh, diversity. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. If no, that's um, I can't, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I believe the answer is yes, because I'm pretty sure that the reef life people have, have done that. Um, but, but what I will say is it, it's certainly known for corals that you can go to the most diverse eco regions in the world and you, you, you still see high local, there's a very, there, you, there remains a strong correlation between regional and local richness for corals. Um, so I, I, my guess is it's the same for fish. Um, I, I, I need to be able to answer that question. <laughs> um, so um, take conventional fish obviously that I got through this talk was about complementarity. The species mm -hmm. are doing different things mm -hmm. and functional diversity. One measure of it is <clears> that species richness contributes functional diversity. Early on, you introduced the talk about not just biomass, but also stability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so the other aspect of diversity would be redundancy. You know, complementarity is terrific, and then that provides some of this functional yeah that that's that's a really good question um that was more difficult for us to get at with this data set because we we don't have time series so i mean ideally what you what you'd like and well i should say for, at least for, for the data set we were using we don't have that there there are in fact time series for a lot of the australian sites and that would be a really interesting thing to look at in in other words um <coughs> At least with these kind of data, the, the most straightforward way to estimate stability would be, you know, what the coefficient of variation through time. Um, it just so happens. I, I pulled this out because I thought I had too many slides, but now, now since you've asked, I'll, I'm going to show you. So um, from the reef life data, we, we tried to get at this question. That's not what I want to do. Um, by, is it? 
it doesn't matter, you can see it. We, we tried to get at this question by um, look, looking at how, um, how the fish communities responded to uh, annual variation in temperature. Okay, so, so what, what I'm showing here uh, is the biomass of fishes from reflex survey uh, as a function of the annual range in sea surface temperature. So this is something that, that one can get for most parts of the world. So it's not stability per se, but, but what the way, I'm in, the way I want to interpret it is as um, the response of the fish biomass to, to a variable climate or you know this is with, within a site. Now what what's what I've sh I'm showing in the two panels here is we we, we tried to get at um, the role of whether there is a, an effective diversity on the response to that variability and and so what we did was to, to take a really simple approach by just taking the whole data set chopping it in half with the sites that were below the median diversity for the whole data set on one side those are called low richness sites and the ones that were higher on the other side okay so, so these are the, the so-called low richness sites. Oh dear, what have I done? Um, <laughs> okay, let's go back here. I don't know how that happened. Um, yeah, I won't touch it this time. So on the left, this is um, what, what you can see, first of all, is, is as one might expect, that, that sites with much more variable climate or temperature at least tend to have lower fish biomass, that there's, there's a negative slope to that line and that is significant despite all the folks being uh, scattered. But the slope of that line is actually shallower among the high richness sites. So that suggests that the diverse sites are less affected by climate variability. Now it is true that most of these are tropical blue and there's a lot of temperate sites here. But even if you restrict this to um, an annual range of less than like 10 or 12 degrees, where you have a lot of overlap between the high and low richness sites, there's still a significant difference between them. So that's the only answer I can provide to, to that. There, I will say that experiments, meta-analyses of experiments have also shown that uh, on average, the diverse um, treatments tend to be more stable. There's a lot of variability, of course, but, but on average. Um, so for a lot of the coral reef sites, you showed that there's really high biodiversity that's affecting the biomass, but there's also high functional diversity. Mm -hmm. So in temperate systems, we you hypothesize that even though there's lower <coughs> species diversity, there's actually higher functional diversity. And so the loss of those species could be more detrimental uh, just by their functional diversity. What I think we can say is that there is less functional redundancy, getting back to this question, in, in the temperate, in the, especially in the cooler temperate systems, where you might have one shark and, you know, one large predatory fish and, you know, one schooling planktivore, um, whereas in Indonesia, you have 30 of each of those, right? Um, so that that's just speculation. But in fact, we did see, and I didn't show this figure, but in the same paper, we found that the slope of the diversity, the species richness versus biomass relationship was a lot stronger at high latitudes. And, it's, and my guess is that that's because there's less redundancy there and that you, you, you lose a species and you, you lose whatever it's doing. Yeah, so this is kind of a long shot, but um, do you know if anybody has ever looked at these ideas by in through deep time. I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. like the strat line. So mm -hmm. if you go back three and a half billion years ago, presumably, you know, productivity was mm -hmm. all lower, right? Mm -hmm. were, if, if you're correct. Um, so, you know, we have pretty good ways now of estimating taxonomic richness mm -hmm. at various points in geological time. Um, is there a way of estimating productivity? Um, in that way, you know, you can, you can look at situations where you have very different sort of chromatic Right. That has been done, actually. And of course, I'm not going to be able to remember the, the name of, of the author. But um, there was th there are ways that you can get at, you know, ocean water column productivity from isotopes and so on. And um, and uh, I'm not remembering the name, but there was somebody who looked through a long uh, fossil series and, and looked for the correlations between um, estimated productivity and 
richness, probably a foraminifer or, or you know, something like that, that that is you know present in large numbers in, in, in these in these fossils. And there was a positive effect, but that it it, it becomes uh, a, even more problematic than these data in the sense that um, you've, you're, you're, you're dealing with evolutionary time there too. And, and you know, the, the question there is what, it's, it's, a, it's a chicken and egg um, question as it is here. You know, d does, does diversity respond? I mean, we, we know that favorable environments support more individuals, that tends to support more species. So you, th that might explain that kind of um, um, pattern in the fossil record. On the other hand, we can also say um, this is a relationship that's predicted by theory. We see it in experiments. We see it in these observational through space data. And it also appears to be the case through time in the fossil record. So there's only the one paper that I know about. Um, and if I can remember it, I'll let you know. It was in PNAS. I remember at that point. But, uh, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. All right. Well, um I have a couple of quick announcements. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, our next seminar is actually going to be on March 23rd during the CEE Graduate Student Symposium at 12 o'clock. Um, and for those who are interested, any graduate student who does any type of ecology or undergraduate or postdoc um, can register. And so uh, talk to Katie if you're interested in doing that. Um, we'll also be heading over to Top of the Hill for happy hour um, right after this. So if you would like to come, please, please come join and ask Emmett a bunch of questions. I'm sure he'll have in. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know how to get out of this thing. <laughs> Emma, the event was he was coming between the <laughs> he was coming between